So yeah, dude, this book is literally my fucking life. We're the same person in a different universe. That's crazy, It's yeah. so crazy. Tell me about like the bands, like your connections, like some of the bands in here. Like uh, you say, you you told us you love Bayside, but yeah, uh, I love Bayside. Um, who else do you like connect with in here? Like, what do you? Um, what are, I, all, pretty much all of them, dude. Jimmy Eat World. I have uh, this really cool story. So, Atticus, which is what we were talking about yeah. the other day, they came out with a DVD called Riding in Vans with Boys, and that was my staple for life when I was a kid. I wanted to be, <coughs> and it's like it follows this band, Cut You Up, who goes on tour with Blink One Eighty Two and Green Day on the Pop Disaster Tour. Oh, yeah, yeah. In like 2002. And um, I just fell in love with this DVD. And Jimmy Eat World is on the tour with them. And Jimmy Eat World was the, was it the first? I went to see Green Day play when I was like 12 years old and Jimmy Eat World opened up for them along with Flogging Molly, I'm pretty sure. And it was just the raddest, it was like my first real experience as a, at a punk concert, you know? yeah. and then like I went to Warped Tour like two years later, and then just started getting fucking crazy with punk. Um, but that was like, they were like part of my first introduction to the punk world. And since then I've played with Cut You Up. The last show that my oh, band wow. played with, um, we were in San Diego playing with Cut You Up, and it was the raddest thing. I got really close with um, Brandon, who's in the band, and we've had just really cool connections, and about sobriety and about a bunch of stuff. And so that's that I love. I always will have a huge place in my heart for Jimmy Eat World. Bayside is also like a huge, massive, massive, massive band for me and my brother. Like it's the first band that my brother and I really kind of like connected with. I mean, yeah. we, al we always loved Blink-182 growing up and, but we were, we were at an age gap where like my music was still just a little bit too older than his music. Yeah. A little bit like that. And then Bayside, he was like, I think I was like 17 and he was 14 or something. That was the first band that we were just like, we die hard fans of together. We would go to all their shows. And then I got an email from Anthony, the lead singer, um, randomly. I was on set of Teen Wolf and I opened my phone, got a new email, saw the subject and said, hey, it's Ant from Bayside. And like literally my impulse, I like got jolted and my phone launched out of my hand. And I was like, what the fuck? And I went and grabbed my phone and I read the whole email. He's like, hey dude, I've, saw, I've seen that you've like posted a lot about our band online, uh, which I had no, I did not have any intentions for the bands to see. I just wanted to show fans of mine, yeah. my world, you know? And, and he's like, dude, whenever we're in town, I'll let you know and come to our shows. And so I took him up on that immediately and went yeah. to a bunch of their shows and saw him at Warp Tour a bunch of times. And then he started working for this merch company and then my, my old band, um, got with that merch company and he was like our right hand man uh, through that whole entire thing and so I got really close with them so so yeah dude this book is literally my fucking life we're the same person in a different universe that's crazy it's man. so crazy track four poison in my veins Bayside night skies black and I'm The night sky is black and I'm awake, lying on the ground. The grass beneath my feet is hard and cold just like I've come to be. The stars are gone behind the clouds and I can't see a thing. So I'll just let my eyes stay closed, just like me. I can't open up. So I woke up today in that king-size bed in the Times Square Renaissance. And I'm not upset about that at all. Like I said, I've never wanted to kill myself. And yesterday wasn't even a depression or a misery thing. Well, uh, maybe it was a little because of the girl. And you know, the girl doesn't really mean one girl in particular. I mean, right now, it means one in particular. But if I weren't here in New York, this particular girl wouldn't be the girl. I'm sure some other girl would be. Even if I were at a particular point in my life where I didn't know a girl to be the girl, the idea of the girl is enough to drive me to the drink and the drugs. Jesus, I just woke up and I already sound like a drunken rambling buffoon. My morning Adderall should fix that right up. It doesn't necessarily take my mind off that idea, but it helps my mind turn that shit into something.
There's something in an empty bed that makes it hard to close your eyes. It can eat at you until they both turn black and blue. And all you want is a reason you should live or a way for you to die. A way for you to die. I thought about calling my family today. After writing that in case of suicide note last night, I thought a lot about how much I love those folks. And I thought maybe I should call and tell them. But then I started drinking. Of course, that was after my morning amateur speedball, Adderall and Xanax. I had a nice morning glass of Johnny Walker and then realized that there was a coffee maker in my room. So, since I declared this weekend a work weekend and I never start a work day without coffee, I made myself a cup. And poured some Walker in there too. My mind was scattered for a few minutes before the drugs kicked in. Take a shower, go get food, write, drink. Do I need to take a shower? I'm in a hotel room and I don't plan on seeing anyone for days. I need a drink. I need to start the day with a drink. Focus. Pour yourself a drink, then everything else can happen after that. Should I go get food first and bring it up and drink with my food? Just drink! Then you can go get food. Bring it up and drink more with the food. <laughs> Great idea. But I need to take a shower. See, if I were a junkie, would showering even be on my priority list? I don't think so. So, I took a shower with a shower beer. Compromise. So, I hit Times Square to grab some street food. From a street vendor, not a street trash can. And wander around. Because I'm all wrong, and I don't see a chance to fix this head. So just give up, write me off, pretend I don't exist. I'm in all these like Facebook groups for like Bayside fans or Wonder Years fans mm. or like you know fans of the bands I mentioned in this book. For someone like me, going to shows is like what helps me live. You know, Absolutely, going and like hearing those bands live, feeling it in person with all these other people mm. who are feeling it too. That's such a you know great therapy for me mm. um and so something i just realized yesterday is that because people you know talk to me from that perspective of like connecting with this book because there's bayside songs in it mm. or jimmy Eat world songs or dangerous summer songs that they didn't know about or they like forgot about the dangerous summer and now they're listening to them again mm. and it's just like going to a show you know like yeah, the totally. people who talk to me about it or like there'll be like Facebook threads on those groups about somebody will post this book and be like, hey, have you guys seen this? And then like 30 strangers I've never met will like, and I, I'll get on there too and we'll you know talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's just like going to a show, you know, when we can't go to that's shows cool. right now. Yeah, that's really cool. Like, it, and that's something I just like, actually when I was emailing Jimmy Eat World's management, it just hit me this morning. Yeah. But I was like, it's kind of like this. And that's why I think, I don't think it's important for me, I think it's, I mean, only for me, it's important for our community because it's giving them something that we can all get together on right now. Sure. You know? <laughs> That's fucking cool. I never actually thought about that either, dude. Yeah, like, dude. What's so cool about our community, the punk community, the emo community, is that like, there always has, because it's emo, there always has been an element of like being really vulnerable and yeah. kind of like <clears throat> wanting to talk about mental health and, and, and get to the root of it. And there's so many throughout the years of going to Warp Tour, there's all these different, um, like, not charities, but just, like, uh, like organizations, organizations and, yeah. that, that deal with, like, mental health and, and getting it out there. And, like, I remember the last couple of years at Warp Tour, there was this uh, organization that would hop on the microphone before Knuckle Puck came on, and this dude would just pump up the audience, talk to your fucking friends, make sure your friends are okay, and, like, just, like, talk about mental health, and he would yeah. pump up the band while there was feedback going on, and it was just this powerful fucking thing, and, dude, I get it. Like, it is, it is so therapy, and, like, I, one year at Warped Tour, Bayside was doing their acoustic performances, and my brother and I are diehard Bayside fans, like, cry listening to their records, hold each other while we're watching them sing, and Ranieri, Ant, Ant was like playing this song. I think it was uh, Sarah Par is it Partial. Oh know. yeah, that's one of his like solo songs. Yeah, one of the solo things. Yeah. yeah. So we started doing the solo stuff. He got on and like I'm pretty sure because we know him. We throughout <coughs> the years we've gone to his shows and he's met us before and he loves us and actually, I actually don't want to speak for him, <laughs> but I think he loves us. <laughs> uh, but he I'm pretty sure made eye contact with us while while it was happening and it was just this moment of just like 
this community is real and, yeah. it's, and super, like such a community. And I fucking love that. I eventually came to the Playwright Tavern, a Celtic pub. It looked exactly like a Celtic pub should, and it had Smithix on tap. So I pulled up a bar stool and I ordered my pint. It was still only about 1.30 p.m. and I was well on my way to drunk. Thanks to a double of Johnny Walker. By 3 p.m., there was no more on my way about it. I had reached my destination. I was drunk. But, like I've said every time I've defended my alcoholism, I can do this today. I don't drink at work. I don't call out sick from work when I'm hungover, nor do I go to work drunk or hungover. In fact, I've been told by my boss on multiple occasions how impressive it is that I can be out drinking until 4 a.m. and still be at work the next day on time, looking professional and staying on task. That is, until the day I came in after our open bar Christmas party with my face smashed up like it had been dragged across a rough concrete sidewalk. A smarter, more professionally minded person might have said he had gotten mugged, but not me. I let everyone know that when I got home, I dropped my keys, leaned over to pick them up, and just kept going. My face hit the rough concrete sidewalk outside of my apartment. I had a lot of tequila and Johnny Walker that night. But the next morning, I got up, cleaned my face wound a bit, and I went to work, which is more than I can say for some of my superiors who were just hungover and didn't even show up. I keep my responsibilities and fulfill my obligations. To me... That separates the addicts from the abusers. Yes, I abuse drugs and alcohol, but only when it's okay to do so. I'm in a luxurious hotel for the weekend, on someone else's dime. I don't have a wife or kids who need my attention. Should I sit here sober and sad that I don't have anyone who would be affected by my actions? Or should I sit here drunk and sad that I don't have anyone to share it with? <laughs> no brainer. We're what? Tell, we're like 10 years yeah, different, exactly, yeah. 10 years older, 10 years apart. Mm. Um, but yeah, like you're, and that was another thing too, is like you're the exact age I was when I wrote this, mm -hmm. you know? You know, we've gotten to talk a few times in the past couple of months since we connected on this. We were just talking the other day about how I'm, I'm happy that like, cause you're like getting sober now mm -hmm. and you're talking about how you're better equipped to deal with this stuff. And I didn't get that way till my like mid thirties, you mm -hmm. know? And so I'm happy to hear that like you, figured that out, you're ahead of the curve, at least when, compared to me. Mm. Do you wanna talk about your sobriety, like sure. getting sober? Yeah, yeah <clears throat> definitely, yeah. So like I said, growing up, um, I always felt out of place and I didn't want, the most thing I didn't wanna be was a celebrity or, or, or an actor, you know? There was just yeah. such a stigma in my eyes and in other people's eyes, but in my eyes, I think I hated them the most, you know? I don't know why, I just, I just wanted to be a punk kid from Southern California, you know? Yeah. I didn't wanna be in, this world that just seemed so superficial. And so I just started getting drunk and, and stoned and, you know, just messing around with whatever we could find as kids, you know, and just doing that, I really took that on as, as a lifestyle. And it com I completely became this addict sort of lifestyle. Yeah. And like I said, like my career didn't show for that. Like I, I would show <laughs> up and get work done every single time. I would go to all these events and promote the show. And yeah was always on top of everything, but I, when I came home, all I did was smoke weed every day, all day. And it really started affecting my happiness because I couldn't feel anything, yeah. you know? I was either just numbing myself and then I couldn't feel the numb or the, what I was numbing and then I, I couldn't feel happy because I was just like riding on this fucking numb wave. Um, and then getting drunk. I remember the first time I got really drunk with my friends, I was the first kid that threw up, you know? And uh, I, was, I was always throwing up and I was just like, this is no big deal. I'm just drinking a little bit too much right now. That's and part of it. Yeah, like there, there, there is that thought too, especially when you're young, that like, that's just part of partying and yeah. drinking is it ends with throwing up or sometimes it doesn't end. You puke and rally and then yeah. you come back, but yeah. throwing up is part of it, which yeah. is like crazy. I didn't start drinking until I turned 21, oh. <clears throat> but only because like I was very Christian growing, like in my mm. teenage years. Um, and I was like the lead singer of a Christian band for five years. And so I, I was serious about that stuff. And so I didn't, I didn't drink or party. And then when I turned 21, I started drinking. But I was at least a little more responsible, I think, about it. Um, I didn't like immediately. And then it was like my mid-20s when I just said fuck it and like got completely irresponsible about 
drinking and drugs and mm. just, I mean, that's also what this book is about, being yeah, super irresponsible about drinking and drugs and almost dying multiple times because yeah. of it. Um, did you ever find yourself in, in that position? Because there's like three, I think there's like three times in this book where I talk about just like doing coke and Xanax at the same time and just drinking a ton of alcohol at the same time and um, popping Ambien too, like mixing pills, coke, fucking booze. So like, uh, yeah, my whole life I kind of had this heart murmur and the first time I got sick was in my mom's bathroom from drinking and she was so worried that uh, I was gonna have like a heart attack at, at a really young age. And Did so she know it was from you drinking? Oh yeah. Yeah, I like, I think I, my older brother like gave me the booze and he's like, don't tell mom. And as huh. soon as she came in, I was like, it was Derek. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's like, dude, why the hell did you tell me that? Uh, why'd you tell her that? Um, and so my whole life, I've just kind of had that in the back of my head whenever I'm partying a little too hard, you know? And um, I would, I would uh, whenever I'm partying a little too hard, I would like have a Xanax to calm down or like a bottle of fucking mezcal mixed to calm down yeah. and, uh, and I would text like my ex, you know, and sometimes we'd be in a fight and we, we hated each other. Um, hated, hate's a strong word, but uh, I would text her and be like, hey, please make sure I'm alive the next morning. But um, it, for some reason it didn't stop me. Yeah, like that's, why. yeah, I mean, that's the crazy thing too. It's just, it's, it's just the, the depression or whatever that led you to do it. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I mean, there's points in my book that I talk about, you know, one night where I just did a bunch of, mixed a bunch of drugs and booze and slept for 15 hours, 15 hours, you know? Right. And then when I was in the army too, and I write about that, like just taking four Ambien to go to sleep throughout the day. Cause I just did not want to be awake feeling what I was feeling, waking up and taking more Ambien and like, that shit can kill you if you take too many, you know, Absolutely. you won't wake up. Um, but I was also like mixing it with booze and I had some scares, but those, that didn't stop me. The only thing that ever stopped me was finally getting healthier, mm -hmm. you know, like for some reason. Like mentally healthier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and like actively doing the work to get healthier yeah. and to stay healthier because it doesn't matter how healthy you get. Like, you know, it's still, there's still times where like depression knocks me out and I'll be in bed crying, you know, in, at least once in the last eight months before quarantine mm -hmm. that that happened to me. And I just remember this one time in the last year where I was laying in bed crying and I have to tell myself like, you're not going to kill yourself. You're not going to kill yourself. Don't worry. You're not going to kill yourself. Oh, shit, sorry. Jesus Christ, Tyler, <laughs> the that's professional actually, over that's here. My, that's the my alarm that went <laughs> off that says you've been through harder. Don't do drugs. Nice. Sobriety, baby. All right. And it also says my Good. dogs would love a walk. No. Oh. Because when I was partying too much, they would just be staring at me and be like, when are you going to sleep? Can we go on a walk? And they're like, nope. So, so now I'm a good daddy. That's great, dude. That's yeah. a cool thing to have. Yeah. I'm glad it happened on, I on timed, camera. I, I, I did that on purpose. <laughs> Not at all. Um, when I lived out here, I, I was like doing extra work on TV shows and stuff. And I was on Boston Legal once. And it was like a courtroom scene and a cell phone went off. So it was just like, 40 extras in there. Mm -hmm. And the director was like, whose fucking cell phone is that? Who the fuck didn't turn off their cell phone? And it was Julie Bowen, like the main actress. Oh my God. It was her cell phone. And was she like, yeah. yo, what the she, fuck? No, no, she was like, sorry. Like, cause this was, I mean, Jesus. she was still pretty, like she'd already done Ed. Like she was already on that show. She was still pretty like famous. Uh -huh. She hadn't done Modern Family yet famous. Uh -huh. But she was still like, she like, didn't get mad at the director. Well, that's nice but of like, her. How about, She's got some tools that she knows yeah. how, to, how to use and not get mad. But she apologized to the director. Nobody apologized to the extras. <laughs> right? Because yeah. like, they were the ones being screamed at? Yeah. That yeah. sucks. Uh, I would be oh, the one apologizing for the, to the extras, but screaming at the director. Like, yo, yeah. relax, homie. Yeah. You've got some problems. I understand. <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, man, like I, I still, I mean, not often, but I still like will get hit by depression, like it doesn't matter how, at least as far as I know, and I, from anybody I've spoken to, I've never met somebody that was like, oh yeah, I never get depressed ever again. Like mm -hmm. I beat depression, like it's gone. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't go away. The only way you beat it that time is if you are actively working on giving yourself the tools to, to do it. Yeah. Because like in that moment, I felt suicidal and the only, like, I think the only thing that keeps me from taking a bunch of drugs and you know going to sleep and maybe not waking up is 
I have to tell myself, you're not going to kill yourself. You're not going to kill yourself. This is going to pass. You've been here before. Mm-hmm. Just get past it. But I have to actively do it, you know? Yeah. There's no, like, passive way to beat it for yeah. me. I walked out of the Playwright Tavern, which I would not recommend to anyone looking for Celtic pub experience, unless your idea of a Celtic pub experience is Beyonce blaring over tourist talk. But I can't complain about the $7 double of Johnny Walker. How that costs less than my pint of Smithix makes absolutely no sense to me. I walked out of the pub and straight into a gift shop. When you're in Times Square, it's actually more difficult to not walk into a gift shop. I still hadn't stopped thinking about my family, and still hadn't stopped thinking that I could have died last night. Man, wouldn't that just make everything so much easier? But I was too drunk to call my teenage sisters or my recovered alcoholic father just to tell them that I love them. They would suspect that I was drunk. Not that it matters to me. Well, it kind of matters to me. Like I said, as long as I fulfill my responsibilities, I think I'm doing all right. But my dad has been brainwashed by AA for over 30 years and still believes he can't have one drink. So calling him would just make him worry. My sister doesn't understand the real world yet. And because of things, my brother, who also has never had a drink in his 30 plus years, has told her she thinks I'm an alcoholic. So, while the most burning thought in my head at that moment was, I just want to tell my family that I love them, I couldn't do it. So, I looked at postcards. Maybe I could just send them postcards. I thought of my niece and nephew and how I really want them to have better lives than my brother and I had. I want to send them postcards that show them how amazing this city looks. I want to spark their imaginations. I want to inspire them. I want them to believe that they can get away. I'm also drunk and probably tweaking a little bit since I doubled up my morning dose of speed. And who knows what the hell scotch and coffee does to you. So, I decided that children do not need to receive the drunken ramblings of their crazy uncle who has never been the most stable guy they've known. Sober or not. Oh shit. I'm that uncle. The ground's opening up. I'm falling down below. An endless fall into a place that I don't think a child should know. That's something I want to talk about too, because like, you, know, you were just talking about you know, your drug use and there's a lot of me talking about my drug use in the book. And I don't want to like ever have it seem like I'm, uh, you know, romanticizing exactly. it or like yeah. um, trying to make it look cool or anything that I locked myself in a hotel and did this. Like if you read the book, it doesn't go well, you know, it's like there's, yeah. there's this, and it's something I mentioned too about like the Chelsea hotel, the chapter where like, you know, Dylan Thomas died there mm-hmm. and like Jack Kerouac lived there and Bukowski lived there. And like those people have these reputations that are so romanticized, especially Bukowski, like was a drunk, you know? Mm-hmm. And I definitely, and I've had people compare it to like, you know, fear and loathing in Las Vegas because it's a, a big rant about abusing drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, not in a good like not it's definitely like in like fear and loathing it's definitely like made to look cool you know sure and i hope it's not in my book because it's not it's definitely definitely abuse and um and yeah i mean i don't want to spoil the ending i'm still here yeah but uh there's, Your ghost. <laughs> there's there there is a point in in reading the book where I like before I put it out where I I didn't know how it ended like I it's kind of ambiguous but I'm still here so mm-hmm. um, but like I kind of felt like does this guy live like how does this guy live because yeah, yeah. that person doing all that shit should not still be alive. Yeah. Um, and I hope that that comes across in the book because I don't want anybody to think I'm glorifying. glorifying. That's the word I was go. looking yeah, for. Yeah. I don't want anybody to think I'm glorifying this shit. Yeah, I mean, even with... Because we were talking about, the, about it the other night where it's like a lot of artists, they don't, I don't know if they rely on it, but you know, there's like this element of this edge that it gives them. Yeah. Um, 
doing drugs and getting all fucked up and then even sometimes like dying from them, you know, like the whole 27 Club thing. Like there's like yeah. that sort of glorification of it. Um, but if you really, if you really look at it, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's bad. You don't want to live that way. Things are, are number. You're not a good person. You're not as good as you can be. Um, I went through it, you know, and like my life was falling apart, even if it didn't look like it, it really was. It's not a good way to live. And this is by far like I've, and it, it kind of prevents you from being who you are. Yeah. You know, you think you know that you are. I tied myself to drugs and to, to smoking and, and to booze at such a young age because I really felt like it made me who I was because I was trying yeah. to separate myself from whatever. And so the thought of getting sober was scary to me because I'm like, fuck, am I going to lose everything that I am? Because like this is such a big part of me. But uh, I'm still fucking edgy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like we're covered in tattoos. And <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't, that's not what gives you the edge. There's a cool... A uh, quote from Mark Hoppus where he goes, "True punk. I don't have to be covered in tattoos to be punk. A true punk is punk on the inside." He's quoting uh, Karate Kid, nah. but uh, but it's Mark Hoppus's quote: "True punk bleeds punk on the inside." Um, and I just thought that was always kind of cool and, and stuck with me. But it's true. Man. I was hoping you were. For some reason, I thought you were going to quote Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> I was like, Let's see if I can. Uh, what? <sighs> Who? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, no. It's good that you, like it's. I'm glad you said all that because it made me just realize now that it's really also like kind of makes you weak. Like if you think yeah. you need drugs or booze to be creative, that just means you're like, you have a crutch. Mm -hmm. Like, and I say it in the book, like I, I, I say that I don't think I need drugs and booze to be creative. It's just when I drink a lot or, or did drugs, I got more in touch with my emotions, mm -hmm. but like, if you're good, you don't need that shit to get in touch with your emotions. Yeah, like if you are a good writer or a good actor or as far as creative people go, if you're good at it and maybe you're not that good at it yet, you know, like I wasn't, but I think I am now, you know, mm. that, and it's, it's like right before we did this, you know, I made a joke about how I had a bottle of Johnny Walker when, <laughs> when I did this with AJ and, and I was like, you know, I, I had that to like rely on and like relax and talk, but like, Obviously, I don't need that, you know? Like, I'm just drinking straight vodka out of that water bottle. Dude, heavy. Um, um, no, but, like, I did, I was a little nervous about that because, like, and yeah. AJ, and AJ is, like, my top, like, favorite singer, songwriter ever. Like, yeah. he, his songs that he's written are just so important to me. And so I was nervous talking to him, mm. but, and I had talked to him plenty of times before, but like to get in depth with stuff. And we like split a bottle of Johnny Walker while we had that. Mm. And I, I thought I needed that to like be comfortable enough to have that conversation. Right, right, right. But like, I, I haven't talked to you as much as I talked to him. So I, you know, was a little nervous about doing this, but I don't need a bottle of Johnny Walker to get through it, you yeah, know? Yeah. So like, it's a weakness to think I need that. It is, to, and, we're, and, and we're conditioned to yeah. think that. Like with everything, even like it just, so I just had a first date with a girl. She's like, hey, what kind of drink do you like? And I was like, I'm actually, I don't drink, um, but feel free to bring whatever you want. She's like, actually, no, it's okay. And I was like, yeah, let's just sit in our nerves. Um, but then we like, we hung out and she made uh, like like a couple hours after hanging out. We, it was a great night. It was awesome. Um, so so fucking cool. And then she even mentioned she's like, you know what's cool about like not drinking or even smoking right now is that like, whenever there's a lull on a first <laughs> date or even just hanging out with somebody, it's like, okay, cool, I'm gonna grab another drink or okay, I'll, I'll roll another joint up or something like that. And we just sat with it and 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 it became normal and we were able to, one, remember everything, yeah. be, be super fucking present, and we had a better time, Yeah, you know? And there's not that crutch or that condition. Like, we're so conditioned to the second, the second there's a slightest bit of silence or anxiety or nervousness, it's like, okay, I have to go fix that. I have to go, yeah. like, like, curb that anxiousness immediately when, like, sitting with it is life. Like, that is really what we're supposed to be doing and not numbing ourselves. And it's like, uh, I don't know, it's not as exciting, I guess, as it can be. You're doing it, you, it's, it's not the drugs that's the issue, it's yourself. Yeah, and exactly, that's the challenge of it. It's like, I could say that, like, drinking a bottle of Johnny Walker while doing these interviews makes it more fun or something, but this isn't any different than me talking to AJ, but than when yeah. I did that with AJ, yeah. you know? It's like, we are capable of it. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it, that's why it's a weakness, because it's like, easy to just be like, ah, just throw in the booze. Like yeah. it'll, you know, it'll loosen everybody up. But like, 
just learn how to be fucking loose. Yeah. Just learn how to talk to people and like be a normal person without it, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. And easier said than done, sure. Of course. Because I'm fucking 38, I'll be 38, and I'm just kind of getting to that comfortableness sure. with Me myself. Too, yeah, yeah. Um, but it fucking changes everything once you get there. So like work on getting there because yeah. that's how I, I like I I'm so glad that I finally put this book out because it I held on to it for like five years because I was too scared to put it out, but also because I didn't feel healthy enough and I didn't want people to know I was sh- what I struggled with. And now I do feel healthy enough to mm-hmm. to like if somebody was like, oh my god, Mike does is that is like that depressed and I could I can now I can be like I mean I'm not now, but I was. And, and so like, I'm learning so much about myself being able to talk about this and being able to talk to other people about their perspectives of mental health because I'm learning from you and I'm learning from AJ and I'm mm-hmm. learning from the people who message me on Facebook and stuff. And that's great because that's how we get through this is we learn from each other. Um, and like, hopefully somebody will hear us talking about how like, you really already are that person that mm-hmm. booze brings out of you. You don't need it. You just told yourself you need it. Practice without it, and you'll just be that person without it, you know? And then you can, like, drink as social as you want if you want to, Mm -hmm. but you don't have to rely on it, you know? Absolutely. Um, And that that changes everything, man. It really does, man. Being in the moment and, like, even if you do have, like, a cool experience, it's like you, you, with AJ, right? Yeah. It's like you guys, you know, you were, you, you had the drink, you were, like, having a fun moment like this, but then, like, afterward, after this, we'll be able to actually, like, sit in the moment and sit with it. Yeah. And be like, okay, that was actually dope. I remember fucking everything, and, like, you know, it's just booze and everything else. Any substance can really alter your state of being in the in, in the present and and numb you even if you don't feel it you know, yeah it's still hindering you in the slightest bit and that's um we're so conditioned to to, to rely on that on that one drink to to calm the silence 7 p.m came as quick as my alcohol buzz went i was getting tired and had plenty of work to do so i put a pause on the drinking and i tried to pep up a bit with a little more speed i've definitely tripled my daily dose today Possibly more, since I came into my room earlier to pop a pill, but within 30 seconds couldn't remember whether I took it or not. I couldn't find it anywhere, but I knew for a fact that I had not ingested any liquid, so did I just throw it down my throat, or did I drop it on the floor? I assumed I threw it down my throat. I wish I had some cocaine. Actually, I've wished I had some cocaine all day. For some reason, that seems to do the job better than Adderall. A poor workman blames his tools, right? I guess I'll work with what I've got. The poison 